We're seeing the weakness in the legs. In muscles that are outside the distribution of just the L5 mm -hmm. root. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm starting, I think I'm starting to see some weakness there in the right arm. So the, the hallmark of ALS is that it's a disease that it's affecting the peripheral nervous system, the motor nerves, and the brain, mm -hmm. and spinal cord simultaneously. Mm -hmm. um, so I am concerned. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it's not a, a yes-no mm -hmm. test. There is no yes-no test. That's the trouble. For ALS. Um, you're, you're somewhere in that middle category based on what I'm seeing. Possible, probable? You're in the probable, in the middle. Not possible and not definite because I'm seeing really sort of two body segments in mm -hmm. you. Do you have questions about what I've said so far? No. Okay. more as you go further down yeah but anyways we ju we just feel like we've lost the ability to recreate in our lake we we don't actually have regulatory authority like i as a health department cannot close this beach it's the town that actually closes it okay so um i'll reach out to the i, I mean i'll be in we've touch talked with the town to the town anyway. we've told them we don't think the signs are yeah. sufficient but i hope it clears up for you it's, it's thanks real shame I work for the Vermont Department of Health in the Environmental Health Division, um, and I am part of the cyanobacteria program. Uh, and I'm here to collect some water samples that will then be tested for cyanotoxins. All right, well, that's about all there is to it. Okay. I, yeah, I will, definitely. Talk to you later. Okay, bye. Okay, I'm gonna get your amino acid to flush it. I moved to Vermont because I wanted open spaces. I was a big backcountry snowboarder. Yeah, I used to raise vintage car. Yeah, I was a speed junkie. My highest speed ever, 137 miles an hour in my little sports car. On a whim, I came up here and the snow at Jay Peak was miles better than any place else I've been. I stood up to the real estate office and I talked to a guy, I, I told him I want to be able to drink beer, shoot guns, and have no way to call the cops. Oh my gosh. <laughs> he gave me a bunch of maps, and I came out here. I actually climbed a tree and looked out, I said, 
my guy against CJP. And that's how I started here. Okay, so I'm going to check your speech now. Mm -hmm. I'm testing your articulatory apparatus. I get it. And how, how strong it is. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to make you repeat some syllables. Mm -hmm. So first, can you repeat after me as fast as you can? Pa, 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 pa. Good. Now, can you, can you repeat after me? Ta, ta, ta. ALS is unfortunately a progressive neurodegenerative disease, so people get worse over time. Depending on where their symptoms began, they may have continued difficulty with speech and ultimately the speech becomes so difficult to identify or other people to sort of relate to the speech that they may need some assistance with their speech. Swallowing may become difficult and some people end up having a gastrostomy. I lift this ankle up like that for me. I mean, keep it up there. Yeah, so this is the one that's... Uh, that's the, that's okay. my problem. And then some people may get weak enough in their arms or in their legs that they may have impaired function and they may need assistance with daily activities, with hygiene, with clothing, etc. They lose muscle, they get weaker, or they may have difficulty with walking as time goes on. The rate of progression is different in different people. And I think that if one is truthful with them and tells them as to what to expect over the next maybe three months or six months or so, then they can raise themselves, they can prepare themselves, the families can prepare themselves. It's all started about maybe eight years ago when I had some students who wanted a project to work on, some undergraduate students. So I had to map out all our ALS patients that we had in our data banks. And we found some areas where it looked like the ALS was clustering. And one of those was Lake Muscoma, which is just a little east of here in New Hampshire. We did some calculations and found that there was about a 40 times higher incidence of ALS there. Uh, we weren't sure what, what the link would be there, um, but obviously just the water body being there seemed like a possible target. So we were asking a lake biologist, Jim Haney, who's over at UNH, and he said, oh, well, you know that that lake has annual cyanobacterial blooms. Right now, um, we are going to uh, look at a water sample under um, a field light microscope that we have right here. So basically, we drop down a net and we picked up some water um, from the bottom of the water body and we pulled it up and we put it in this tube and then we let this tube sit for 20 minutes. Um, and what that did was some of the larger bacteria and other sort of particles um, floated to the bottom. And so what we have on the top layer now are the smaller cyanobacteria. Um, and that's really what our lab's interested in looking at in these different water bodies that we sample. And so what we normally do is we have this little contraption here and we will hook up someone's phone to it and we'll just like stick it right on here and take pictures of it. Okay, one, two, three. Thank you all for coming today to help us to raise awareness in the fight against ALS. So uh, we thought that was intriguing, especially after uh, sort of brushing up on the literature a little bit because uh, of the association of cyanobacteria in the population in Guam where there was a very high rate of ALS. Did you get wet? Did I get wet? <laughs> and cyanobacteria were living in the roots of the cycad plant. They had a symbiotic relationship. And they also produce a myriad of toxins. And there's one toxin called BMAA, which has been associated with a high rate of ALS in Guam. And the Romanian natives there were eating these uh, seeds off the cycad plant. They were making a pulp out of it, making a flower out of it. The same bacteria that were in the plants um, that the natives were eating in Guam were uh, the same bacteria we were finding in Lake Lascoma. And in fact, cyanobacteria are ubiquitous. They're found all over the world. Um, and under the right conditions can really blossom and cause these big blooms. 
Most of the clusters we've, we've seen are in close proximity to water bodies um, that have had a history of blooms. Lake Champlain is a beautiful water body located in the northeastern corner of the United States. It's 120 miles long, it stretches from uh, almost down to the Massachusetts border of Vermont and into New York, all the way up and into the Canadian border with, with Quebec. It serves roughly 145,000 people almost every day for, as a drinking water source. The lake is a major source of, of tourism for the region. Dr. Stumble cares about what everyday people are exposed to and whether it causes disease later on in their lives. He is interested in whether aerosolization of cyanobacteria could potentially cause this neurotoxin called BMAA or beta n methylaminoalanine, protein misfolding over large periods of time of exposure. So theoretically what we're trying to do is putting together cyanobacteria exposure, it getting into the human body, and then potentially neurodegenerative disease. So this is an air pump. Um, where we have a set flow rate of liters per minute, and then we put um, screen on, on it so then little particulates wouldn't come up that would block out what we actually want to collect, which is we're trying to look at cyanobacteria um, cell counts over a water body over about six hours worth of time, because um, then you can compare the filter with lung tissue. As you enjoy Lake Champlain and other Vermont waters in the summer, remember they're home to all kinds of life, including cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria can be toxic, so if you see it, stay away. 1,797 views. It's pretty high for a health department video. So we know that cyanobacteria can present a risk to people if they come in contact with water that contains cyanobacteria. So cyanobacteria cells can cause rashes and skin irritations. We also know that cyanobacteria can create toxins inside their cells. So that means if people swallow this water, if they drink water containing cyanobacteria or the toxins, they could become sick. Well, it's poisoned. A few years ago, got uh, eye infections in both eyes. Because of it, I was just sitting on my lawn, I was just at my house and the wind was blowing on and I ended up with this big infection. In 2001, the Vermont Department of Health worked with a researcher who was at UVM at the time to start monitoring for cyanobacteria. That was in response to a couple of deaths of dogs that were suspected to be caused from cyanobacteria. We don't currently monitor for the presence of cyanobacteria cells in the air. It's relatively unknown how many cyanobacteria cells will aerosolize in the lake waters and the conditions that we have here. We will set up aerosol collectors along the road um, at different intervals. 200 meters, 400 meters, 600 meters, and then I believe a mile. And we are looking to see whether or not aerosol exposure goes out that far and whether then we could back model how far you would have to live to be exposed at what extent. Do you have to be right next to the lake or can you live a mile away from the lake and still be breathing in cyanobacteria and potentially being exposed? Cylindrospermopsin and microcystin are primarily liver toxins. The other toxin they've provided some guidance on is called anatoxin and anatoxin is a neurotoxin. When it was first discovered, anatoxin was nicknamed very fast death factor because it is an extremely potent neurotoxin. Luckily, we see very little anatoxin, and it, it is striking to see how potent of a toxin anatoxin is. I'm, I'm kind of a, 
uh, antitoxin person as it is, and I've always been a little bit concerned, especially with our son. Neither of us were really um, aware of the disease or how many people it affected and what, what it looked like in a life. Even if you, if you hear OALS and this is what it does, it's so different than actually knowing what it looks like in a person's life and how it affects a person's life. And so we're learning more and more every day um, about that and, and the challenges that it presents. Well, first, it's really important to recognize that ALS is a devastating disease and it does deserve a lot more research. Um, in order to make a strong conclusion about the link between ALS and cyanobacteria, or in order to say that cyanobacteria causes ALS, you need to have some very strong data to support that. So far to date, that strong data has not been available. There's been a lot of local interest and local concern about a possible connection between ALS and cyanobacteria because we are very close to Dartmouth and some of the researchers there are looking into that hypothesis. So we did get a lot of questions about that research. So we wanted to try to put the research into perspective, um, stating that nothing has been proven yet, but that it is an active area of research that we are following. Elijah got a lot of skepticism. I was pretty skeptical of it initially with clusters because clusters are always, you know, people always say, oh, there's a cluster of this and that. And as time has gone on, actually, the hard scientific evidence of this has actually gotten better. It's, it's really a compelling story now with some of the models that he's using and the ability to collect BMAA in tissues. And, you know, it's, it's more hard science rather than simply um, putting little pins in a map and saying, oh, the patients, you know, are around this lake. So what everyone is hoping is we can solve the problem of why we're having blue-green algae uh, blooms, I would say first we need to stop the bleeding. And the bleeding is going back to phosphorus. The phosphorus issue has re-emerged as the common denominator to water quality problems. In this case, it's feeding blue-green algae. Manure is loaded with phosphorus. We've had new restrictions on that and when manure can be applied buffers for agricultural purposes. My name is David Zuckerman. I'm an organic vegetable, organic chicken, and organic pork farmer here at Full Moon Farm with my spouse Rachel Nevitt and our daughter. And uh, we produce about 25 acres of vegetables, about a thousand chickens, and about 30 to 50 hogs to slaughter every year. And then I'm also the Lieutenant Governor of the State of Vermont after serving for 18 years in the legislature, 14 in the House, and four in the Senate. You know, I think a lot of farmers would consider themselves environmentalists. Um, not all environmentalists would consider all farmers environmentalists. And I think it's really important that environmentalists work to understand the plight that the farmers are in. We have seen success in a number of different areas, particularly reducing runoff from urban areas. We have been successful in reducing nutrient loading from wastewater treatment facilities. Um, that's been reduced from 120 metric tons of phosphorus down to uh, 20 or 30 metric tons of phosphorus. The good news is that our nutrient loading concentrations are not still increasing rapidly. I feel like we're starting to, beginning to turn the corner a little bit. Um, the challenge is that we have other effects that are out of our control. For example, our, our changing climate. We have more intense storms um, hitting the watershed now um, that, that cause a lot more erosion of our stream banks and it's, it's really difficult to battle that. The Vermont Lung Association says if you can't breathe, nothing else matters. I would add if you don't have potable water, nothing else matters. <laughs> Who would push against water quality? And, and one, one would say nobody. It's easy to say I'm in when you're talking in generalities, but when you start talking about things that affect people's pocketbooks or their right to do this or that that they believe is inherent to, to life itself, then those details start getting difficult. No farmer wants to pollute the land. It doesn't matter what their practices are. They may or may not always know 
what the best practice is, but they are not intentionally polluting the land. And I think sometimes they feel attacked. When farmers aren't getting paid, but they should be getting paid for their work, that makes it so they have to squeeze the margins. They have to grow closer to the river's edge. They have to put a little more fertilizer on than maybe they would otherwise want to to get a little bit more out of the land that year to save a little bit money on feed costs. When the ultimate scenario is that people are paying what food really costs, uh, then farmers will be better stewards of the land over time. Seeing a lot of ALS patients and, and seeing uh, and, and then having to tell them that they have a deadly disease that you can do absolutely nothing about is pretty frustrating. Um, and having to do that over and over and over again and see the devastation to the families, it's really uh, very um, heartrending. We were both older. I was 45 when I had him and Jim was 46 when he was born. And um, he's just been, he's changed our world. I've gone from being a very involved dad to being um, so un uninvolved in his life right now. And it breaks my heart that I, I can't do, I can't play catch with him or even push him on a swing. I can't even read him a book. That's what makes me sad. It was Olin's first race. Olin was, was it, was he like 11 months old or something? We took him to the races. I never really knew what the word love was until you have a child. It's amazing how, how much joy and feelings you have when you have a child. It's a guy right up there. <laughs> Go grab this picture, Mom. You want me to get a picture? This is him. That's my boy. This is the inspiration to my whole life. I love him so much. He's so dear to me. I want to just watch him grow and go from there. I love you, my boy. Dave was a very large personality. He loved to talk. He loved to tell stories. He was very physical. He was on the U.S. ski team in the in the. 70s and was in the Olympics. I started noticing David changing early in 2014 and he was starting to slur his speech but once he started noticing that it was a little harder to talk he wondered what was going on and through a number of neurological tests and working with neurologists first in Burlington and then um, down at Dartmouth he was diagnosed with ALS. And he was still, we were still happy together. He still took care of the horses as long as he could. Um, and he skied until, I think, March of 15. I studied forestry in college, and my whole world revolves around nature, trees, ecology and everything about it. The property that I, I've taken care of for, uh, since 1990, it's out on Shelburne Point. I planted every blade of grass, every tree, and exotic bush did everything there for years. So Dr. Stummel was trying to make a connection. Possibly there's some neurotoxins on the property. David was really curious about the research and started seeing that there could have been a link 
with where he lived, how he lived, and the research that Dr. Stoppel was involved with. David had lived in Shelburne um, for a number of years, and I didn't find that out about where David had lived until Dave passed away, and I started doing my work with Dr. Stommel, which is to start to increase vis um, awareness, you know, public awareness on the possible correlation between um, blue-green algae and neurodegenerative diseases. It was in 2016 that I was doing an event um, at All Souls Interfaith Gathering in Shelburne. There was a couple at the event, and I met them. They bought my partner David's house in Shelburne, and they indicated to me that their groundskeeper also had recently been diagnosed with ALS. So there were two people on the same property. I was totally just stopped in my tracks to hear this. You know, I knew about the ALS clusters that Dr. Stommel's looking at along Lake Champlain. Um, but to hear that there was a second person, I, I don't even know what more research could be looked at in that particular case. It's got to be some type of connection with the property or with the lake itself. And we had learned of Dr. Stummel's study when we went to the clinic the first time. I didn't know that he was uh, concerned with environmental toxins and then also the potential for genetic predisposition um, to not handle these toxins. And when we spoke to him, he said that, and that's already had been in my mind. We just know that those things aren't necessarily great for our bodies, but some bodies it's even worse for it seems. We're doing a raffle to uh, support ALS uh, Northern Chapter in New England along with um, our good friend Jim and his family. You know, I think it's, I think this issue, it, it's personal, but it's more than personal. This is an issue, I think it's a public health issue that is extremely important to get out. But we have to get the attention of the people that are in a position to make it happen. If it turns out that, that uh, cyanobacterial blooms are a risk factor because of the toxin or toxins that they produce, um, then uh, you know, I think that uh, we need to take the whole issue much more seriously and not only monitor water bodies, um, but clean up water bodies. So those are things that can be changed through policy, through probably through legal action and also human activity, human behavior, all need to be entered into the equation. I don't think it's that quiet little disease that everybody thought it was. It seems to be a lot more prevalent. Um, and, and shocking. Vermont PBS, partnering with local filmmakers to bring you stories made here. For more, visit vermontpbs.org.